Junior Naturalists. It's naturalist Rachel and Ethan here today, and we are at Wedekin Regional Park. The entrance to this park might be a little hard to find, so make sure you come in from the west off McCarran and 4th Street. Wedekin Regional Park has some awesome trails of different difficulty levels. Also has some great views from the top, and it has some great geology, which is exactly why we're here today. But what is geology? Well, let's rock on and find out. Geology is the science that studies the solid earth, the rocks that it's composed of, and the processes that change it over time. Many landforms that we see around us are influenced by the characteristics of the regional rock. Geology can be broken into two categories, physical geology and historical geology. Physical geology is the branch of geology that is concerned with what is happening on Earth in the here and now. Physical geologists ask questions like, where and when do earthquakes occur? And how are rising sea levels affecting the rate of coastal erosion? Historical geology is the study of analyzing Earth's past by investigating rocks and the information found in them, like fossils and minerals. We ask questions like, what can rocks tell us about past climates? And what events took place that made the dinosaurs disappear? So physical geology focuses on the present day planet, or historical geology focuses on the past? Exactly. But Ethan, why should we even care about rocks? Well, besides the fact that we basically live on a giant rock, our planet Earth, rocks and minerals have tons of everyday uses. In fact, you may be even using rocks and minerals without even knowing it. Like when it gets snowy, we'll use the ground up mineral halite to salt our roads. For when we have a tummy ache, we'll have an antacid, which is ground up limestone. And even our toothpaste, which is just dissolved fluorite, is used to keep our teeth nice and healthy. And so, yeah, uh, can you think of other ways that we can use rocks and minerals in our everyday lives? Well, I like to paint rocks, so I go and uh, find some nice smooth rocks that I can paint. I also use rocks to decorate my yard, and sometimes I just like to go out and look for rocks, because rocks change shape and color, especially depending on the location. They can look incredibly different from one another. Absolutely. So let's find out more about rocks from our park pal, Rachel. So I'm going to talk to you guys about igneous rocks, for starters. So igneous rocks are types that come out of volcanoes. So rhyolite used to be a type of magma. You can find it right here in Wedekin Park, actually, with all these beautiful bands on it. So magma is still underneath the earth, but when it comes out, it forms lava, which is still molten rock. But when it dries on the surface, it can sometimes form these beautiful panning patterns where the different layers of lava are interacting with each other. So if you come here to Wedekin, you might see some rhyolite with these beautiful bands in it. A cl close relative of rhyolite is granite, which are gonna be these two. That's what the Sierra Nevada mountains are made out of. Another one you can find here in Wedekin is pumice, which is this light holy rock. And this is actually so light that it'll sometimes float in water. It's the only rock that's light enough to do that. There's also the close relative of pumice, which is called scoria, which is gonna be these two. They still have all these holes, but they're a darker color and they're heavier because they have more metal in them, so they don't float. It's a good way to tell them apart. There's also obsidian, which is a volcanic glass. So it's not quite a rock, not quite a mineral, but it's kind of its own thing. It's a glass and Native Americans used to make arrowheads and tools out of them. It's very sharp, so you can actually cut yourself on the edges if you're not careful. We also sometimes find it tumbled when it's been run through water in this shape like this, especially here in Nevada. So another one that we sometimes find is basalt, which is gonna be these two. And it can be really smooth or it can be really rough depending on the lava that it forms from. And a close relative of basalt is gabbro which is this one, which has this beautiful crystal pattern. So the only difference between these two, or these two different types of rocks at least, is gabbro stayed inside the volcano, where it could cool very slowly and form these big crystals, where basalt came out of the volcano and it dried so fast that it turned into this crystalless form instead. Another example is jasper. We can find a lot of this in Nevada. It comes in these beautiful reds and yellows, sometimes even a mix of colors. This is another one that Native Americans would use to make tools and arrowheads out of. So also with igneous rocks, when they form holes like the scoria, sometimes mineral rich waters will leave behind minerals and create these geodes. This one in particular is called a thunder egg and you can see all the different bands where the water is left behind different layers of minerals in there. 
Another important one that's created by mineral-rich water is the sulfur. So sulfur is found a lot near geysers and hot springs. It doesn't have a very pleasant smell. It's kind of eggy or garlicky. It's really important because we use it for fertilizer and also for some really important medications. Also out of mineral-rich waters, we'll get copper and copper ores like this malachite, azurite, and chalcopyrite. These are all really important because we extract copper out of them that then can be used for electronic devices like phones, electrical wiring, smart boards, all sorts of different things. So also in Nevada, we find these special metamorphic rocks. These are called serpentine. There's this beautiful green, not quite the same green as the copper though, so you can tell them apart. But this green color is really important because it's actually only found here in the western side of the U.S. It's caused when extreme heat and extreme pressure from the processes that build mountains actually crushes different types of rock into this new crystal shape that it wasn't previously in before. So it metamorphosizes similar like a caterpillar into a butterfly into this new type of rock. So the last section we'll talk about are sedimentary rocks. This one right here is a really good example. So this is halite, or you might better know it as table salt. So table salt is actually a sedimentary rock because it forms as water levels drop and these crystals form from the minerals that were suspended in the water. Another really common one, especially here in Nevada, is this calcite. So calcite, you can see all the little bands in it. Each one of those bands is from when the water layer dropped and left behind a new layer of crystals. A main component of calcite is calcium carbonate, which is also what this is made out of, even though it looks completely different. So this is still calcium carbonate, but instead of calcite, we call this tufa. And tufa is really cool because it's only seen here in Nevada. It's also formed from hydrothermal alteration, which is similar to the copper that we saw in the last section. But also this is what the pyramid at Pyramid Lake is made out of. It's a really cool little find here in Nevada. So another thing that kind of falls in between sedimentary and igneous, we talked about how geodes can form. This is another type of geode. This one's specifically an agate. You can see these layers from when the water levels dropped inside of this bubble and it left behind these different layers of quartz and also different layers of metals that came in and formed the color. Also here in Nevada, we find different fossils. So both of these can be found in Nevada. This is just your traditional leaf fossil, while this is called a trilobite. But it's really important to note that leaf fossils and trilobites, which are invertebrates, are legal to collect in Nevada. It's not legal to collect vertebrate bones. So if you see anything with a bone, if you see a footprint or an egg, that is not legal to collect. But if you find these in your travels, you're more than welcome to collect them as long as you don't take too many and leave some behind for others. It's also important to note that Native American artifacts can be found here in Nevada, such as arrowheads and pottery. These are also illegal to take without permission. This one I actually bought to make sure that it was okay for me to take. But if you find any out in, the, in your adventures in the wild, make sure you leave them behind because they might belong to someone. And my favorite mineral, it's actually a sedimentary mineral, this is selenite. So selenite is this beautiful crystal, but there's also another form that we call gypsum. Gypsum gets crushed up and gets turned into wallboard because it's actually fire resistant. So your house is made up of crushed bits of this beautiful rock right here. Minerals are inorganic, naturally occurring substances that have a definitive chemical and crystal structure. So basically this is just a fancy way of saying that minerals are crystals that weren't formed from a living creature. So all minerals are rocks, but not all rocks are minerals. What makes a mineral so special? Yeah, so minerals are so cool. So minerals have a definitive crystal structure. So deep down all the way to the atomic level, they start forming shapes. And so these shapes keep on repeating over and over again until you can actually see the chemical structure. So for example, this pyrite here is a cube. And this is fluorite. Uh, a nicer specimen would look more cubic. So when we talk about geology, we also talk about the changes in rocks over time. Rocks can change due to chemical changes, chemical reactions, volcanic activity, uh, increased pressure, temperature, more water, and even weathering and erosion. So here I have an example of a weathered rock, and weathering is when rocks are broken down. Erosion is when these broken down rocks are then moved. As you can see, one side of this rock is brightly colored, and this is the less weathered side. And the other side of this rock is a duller color. So this is the more weathered side. And a good example of erosion is what we could see back here, this hill over here. 
So rocks are being transported downhill into a little slump and we could see that there's a little divot. So we could say that the rocks moved from one part of the hill down as a good example of erosion. So uh, we could learn more about other ways that rocks have changed and the historical events surrounding Wetakin Regional Park specifically. So let's try to learn more about that. Wetakin Hill Regional Park was formed over many, many, many years, and its current landscape reforms the different geological events that formed it. And so, starting off around 16 million years ago, volcanic activity covered the entire area. Shortly afterwards, water covered the area. Water is similar to hot springs, so full of different minerals like sulfur, and it was able to change the composition of the rocks. And so you could see that with these funky looking rocks here. And afterwards, when the geothermal activity stopped, a period of uplift and erosion is what created the present day landscape that we call Wetakin Hill Regional Park. And so the weathering process is still going on. And this is what's giving us the various pretty shades of black, red, and orange, as we can see here. And so for you, uh, student stewards back at home, try to think about what the Reno Sparks area looked like 16 million years ago. Even though the whole park is made out of rocks, don't forget to look out for a very special type of rock, the Janats rock. It's located right here in this big clump of rocks. And that reminds me, the Janats word of the month is boulder. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, a boulder is the biggest type of rock fragment, usually big enough where you can't really push it. Other types of rock fragments include cobbles and pebbles. There are many interactions between rocks and living organisms that happen here at Wetakin Regional Park. Let's take a look at a few of them together. So on this rock, you can see something called lichen, which you might remember we talked about in last month's Jay Nance video. Lichen is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and al algae. Um, simply being attached to the rock like it is, is enough to cause physical damage in what we call biological weathering. But lichen does something else where it secretes acid chemicals that break down the rock even faster. This ability to eat rocks makes lichen a very important organism in soil formation, and it helps develop the soils that we use to grow food in. Now, if you see lichens, don't touch them, just leave them alone, because they do take a very, very long time to grow. Another example of an interaction that happens out here at Wetakin is desert varnish, which you can see on this rock. This dark coloration on the rock is caused by bacteria uh, attaching to metal deposits in the rock and turning them dark colors like black um, through oxidation. So desert varnish only occurs in arid environments like the desert out here in Reno. So this is something that you're not actually going to see in that many places of the world. The activity for this month is actually a couple of different activities, and we're gonna email you a few of them. So the first one is a scientific journal that you'll receive in your email, and it includes a couple of things you can do, like creating pet rocks, creating designs on the ground out of rocks, and then testing the rocks that you find here at Wetakin for different characteristics. Magnetism is one of the characteristics you can try. Another characteristic you might be able to try is uh, the hardness of the rock. You get two rocks and you scratch them against each other. And if one of them makes lines on the other, then you know that that rock is the harder of the two. Another activity that we'll be sending to you is I Spy Bingo. And I Spy Bingo will include a number of things that we talked about here today, but also some other uh, items you might find in nature. So if you get a bingo, we would love for you to send it to us so that we can see you having fun out here at Wetakin Park. The third activity that you can try while you're out here is making an art map of the rocks that you find while you're here. So you might have noticed that there's a lot of very colorful rocks here at Wetakin. If you bring some paper and a pencil, maybe even some paints or crayons and markers, you can make an art map of the things that you see and then you'll have a very unique and uh, beautiful piece of the rocks here at Wetakin that you can frame in your house or you can even send to us because we really enjoy seeing the art that you make while you do our JNATS program. 
So our leave no trace principles apply to rocks as well. So when we're out here enjoying the park, make sure not to deface or graffiti any rocks around here. This means also that if we come across some sort of petroglyph, we do not deface it. We leave it alone. This is what our naturalist Colleen said for the Court of Antiquity video. So for previous artworks, we leave them alone, but we do not create any of our own. So when we're out here, let's put our geologist caps on, but make sure that we're still good stewards out here in the parks. Well, that's it for this month. Thank you for joining us on our geology journey. I had a rockin' time out here at Wetakin Regional Park, and I hope to see all of you out here enjoying yourself this month. See you next month, Junior Naturalists. Yes.